Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right, the two, two sections I want to talk to you tonight, I want to talk about moments that matter. Um, for the first part of this section, I want to share with you some things very briefly that I shared in much greater detail on Wednesday night. And thank you for all of those of you who took the time to be here on Wednesday night um, to hear the full story. Well, at least, at least the full story of part of the story. Um, and uh, I would invite you to... Uh, Catch up on the fuller detail by going to the website rockofyork.com and uh, listening to the talk on Wednesday night, which was entitled "What's in a Name," and then you'll get the you'll get the full uh, the full impetus of all of this, which is a little over an hour, um, but I think it would be important for you to to listen to. <clears throat> but I need to convey some of that information to you tonight. So I was just over three weeks ago. I was I was sat on a uh, a tracks train um, heading from Murray into Salt Lake City, which Murray is a suburb of Salt Lake City where we've got a, we've got a foot in the door to, to try and bring some of the life of God there. But I was on this train riding into Salt Lake City. It's only about a 15-minute run. And uh, suddenly, while I was on the train, I, I suddenly wasn't on that train anymore. I was actually sat on a train heading from Fuengarola to Malaga in Spain, and I was locked into an experience that I had 32 years ago, and it was just like I was absolutely in the moment. I was there. It was like it was all happening instantly to me while I was sat on this train going from Murray to Salt Lake City. It was like I was on that train 32 years ago, heading from Fuengarola to Malaga with, with Maggie Farimund, who was then butler, and Lucy, who was also butler at that time, and Chris and Joel, who was just a very small boy, about 18 months old, and uh, we were heading on this. The reason, the reason we finished up on that train was because on the Saturday previous to the Wednesday, I had a dream. And uh, in the dream, I saw a man, a dark-haired man, who was totally paralyzed down the left side of his face. And this man with the paralysis in his face was, was bringing a message, and the message he was bringing was, was one I was familiar with the, with the context. In the book of Acts, uh, which is in chapter 17, which is a story of when the Apostle Paul was on a place called Mars Hill, and, uh, and uh, he made reference to an altar that was on the hill, and he said, I noticed that on this altar there is an inscription that says, to an unknown God. So I'm seeing this guy with the paralyzed face and hearing him speak, and I see an image of this altar with written on it, to an unknown God. So then, of course, we wake up, and uh, the following morning, which was Sunday morning, we decide to find some group of believers somewhere so that we could join with them. And we found a small group of believers in a hotel lobby in Fuengarola, and uh, when we walked in, we sat down, everything was fine, but then the guy got up to speak, and when the guy got up to speak, what he sp spoke about was the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill when he saw the altar that had the, the inscription to an unknown God. So obviously my ears pricked up at that, and uh, I went to him afterwards, and I said, look, I said, it's really strange, but I dreamed about this last night. I said, and in the dream, there was a man, a dark-haired man, who was paralyzed, totally paralyzed down the left side of his face. Well, he looked at me and said, that's my pastor. And uh, he said, his wife's here today, would you speak to his wife? So he brought his wife across to me. The guy's name, it turns out, was Dan Del Vecchio, and he pastored quite a large church in in Malaga, just down the coast in Spain, but he had, for many, many years, had the totally paralyzed left side of his face. And so, now I'm into this thing, but I'm seeing this while I'm on the train from 
Murray to Salt Lake City, but this happened 32 years before. Now, I haven't thought about this for years and years and years. In fact, until I was on that train and suddenly felt as though I was riding to Malaga, I had given no thought. I'd actually forgotten about this incident altogether until it fired in me on that day. And, uh, uh, and um, anyway, uh, as a result of, of sharing this revelation, this accurate revelation, uh, we were invited to go to the church on Wednesday night when they had a, a special speaker. And uh, his wife said, would you come along? Would you pray for my husband? So we said, yeah, that's fine. So hence why we were on the train going from Fuengarola to Malaga. It was a difficult experience. It was a very trying experience. Uh, just even getting to the church from the train station in Malaga was incredibly difficult. And uh, I felt very vulnerable with uh, an 18-month-old and Maggie and Lucy as a little girl then and Chris crossing a, uh, I don't know if Maggie remembers, we crossed a wide open field, there were druggies on it and needles and stuff. And Anyway, we get to the church and uh, uh, it's almost like I was a stranger, like we were never invited to be there and uh, kind of reluctantly I said, well, we were asked to come and reluctantly I ushered through to the back room to, to see this guy and uh, his wife introduced me and I told him about the dream and... Um, uh, I said, you know, your wife asked if I would come and pray for you. Is that okay? He says, is that his response was, if you want to. He's really underwhelmed at my presence. Um, he said, lots have prayed for me and nothing ever happened. Well, uh, the good news is, or the bad news, whichever way you look at it, he wasn't disappointed because nothing happened when I prayed for him. So... Uh, um, I don't know what, whose faith that was connected to or no faith at all. I actually... I actually would propose to you that that was never the point. The point was that what I saw in that dream on the Saturday night was in every minute detail totally accurate. And so we were in a challenge, and I think a lot of the challenge was about maybe I wasn't supposed to pray for him. Maybe, maybe it was about being trusting and brave on nothing more than a dream. Maybe it was about proving I could hear the voice of God and seeing whether I was willing to walk in a prophetic revelation wherever it led. So that instant was hard, it was difficult. Our getting back was even more eventful than the going because all of a sudden it's like his wife said, if you come we'll make sure you get home and then was conspicuous by her absence and we couldn't speak Spanish and we finally finished up kind of reluctantly getting someone who drops us off at a train station uh, that was nowhere near where we needed to be uh, and because we tromp across to the train station to find that all the trains stopped running 15 minutes before we arrived. So now we have to get back, and it was, it was a muddle and it was difficult, but the lesson of that is it's not always easy just because you see something clearly or because you have a revelation, but the challenge to me was are you brave enough and bold enough to work with what you see? Now, what I want to tell you is that my life has been punctuated by these kinds of instances um, as long as I can remember. Revelations, clear, specific instructions that each time have proved to be accurate. Now, I don't say that for my honor. I say that because I believe God. I believe the voice of God. And I've learned to trust those voices that come within me. Now, sometimes it doesn't make things easy. It can be as difficult as it was getting to Malaga and you can have the same kind of response. But nevertheless, God was teaching me something that we have used, I believe, hopefully to good effect throughout our life and throughout our ministry. The main fruit in all of these things has come beyond the moment. It's always come as a result of obedience, not just because in the moment we were obedient. Now, the reason I tell you that, and I could tell you many more stories to, to, to verify that scenario of these things punctuating my life, but that's not for tonight. You can listen on uh, last Wednesdays if you want that. But we are at another of these punctuations. And uh, it's a very important one because earlier this year, I heard in the same clear way that I saw Dan Del Vecchio's face in that dream, saw that altar to an unknown God, heard that message, followed that instruction, followed that leading. Earlier this year, I clearly heard in my spirit, you've got to change the name of the church. And so I recognize that voice. I know that voice. And so we're going to change the name of the church, cut a long story short. Okay? 
Uh, now, you might say, why? Why do we need to change the name of the church? It's very simple. We're no longer who we were. 26 years ago, when I took over the senior leadership of this house, um, we were the Assemblies of God Church, York. I didn't like the name. I, 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 didn't, I was not ashamed of the heritage. I appreciated the heritage and everything that brought me to that day. I didn't like the name. Uh, the name described who we were, not who we had become. And so in the first 18 months, I made steps to move, and I heard very clearly that we should change the name of the church to The Rock. So we changed the name to The Rock Church. Almost 25 years ago, we became The Rock Church, and uh, there were reasons for it. One of the reasons was that it described who we were. And uh, many of you have only grown up at a time where you've seen expressions in church life that are very rocky and very stage-oriented. 25 years ago, you were ridiculed for it. You were not accepted for it. It was not the done thing. But we knew God was leading us, and we've always been on the forefront. We've never been the biggest, but we've always been on the forefront of, 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 of revelation and ideas and the way forward into culture. And so we back then started doing something that we call Rock City, which was the forerunner of us meeting on a Saturday night. Uh, we had people out on Micklegate. We were just trying to reach people who were out and about with the good news that we believed that we had, and we did it in a rock style. So it helped to have a name that went along with who we were. So our style was rock, uh, our expression was rock, but also it had, a, it had a, a double meaning in that we also were very, very sincerely connected to Christ being the rock on which our lives were built, our faith was built, our belief was built. And uh, so we became the rock, and that's who we were. But um, unless you've had your head in the sand, for the last 10 years we have been changing, and uh, we are absolutely not who we were. We're not the church who we were. We're not even the people who we were. Um, lots of things have happened, and we have had to move painfully with that change, as painfully as the journey from Fuengarola to, to Malaga, in spite of a revelation, this journey has not been without its pain. But there comes a point where you have to recognize who you are becoming rather than who you were, and we would be under false pretenses, I believe, if we continue to be the rock, because the rock was something, but it's no longer what it was. We've now become something else. And so this same God who spoke to me 32 years ago about Dan Del Vecchio and took us on that journey, I believe is the same God that is speaking to me now. The rock, let me just read this. The rock accurately named and described who we have been, for which we thank God, but we are no longer who we were. The rock has been what it was supposed to be, but now it needs to be allowed to die with dignity. Okay? The new name says something about who we are now and who we are becoming. Okay? There was no faltering doubt or flipping through mental files to come up with options. So it wasn't an issue of, we need to change the name, but I wonder what we should call ourselves. You know, I'll call 15 of my closest friends and... We'll have a committee and we'll see. I don't think that's ever helpful because you come up with natural solutions to spiritual problems. And just like originally, 20, 26 years ago, when God spoke to me about changing the name to The Rock and I knew what the name was meant to be, I knew instantly God spoke to me when I said, why do we need to do it? And he told me why. I knew what it was supposed to be instantly in my spirit. No flipping around, no flipping through mental files, no f calling people or forming a committee to come up with suggestions. I immediately saw it, just like I saw that altar in that dream that said, an altar to the unknown God, I immediately saw in my spirit the letter Q. That was it, a big Q. Immediately when God said you to change the name, I saw the letter Q, and that's it, Q. I knew instantly we were to call and launch ourselves as Q Church. And so in the new year, sometime in the new year, in January probably, the middle of January, we will make the change. We will say thank you and goodbye, and we will, we will allow the rock to die a dignified death because it served its time, it served the people, it's lived its life, and just like with all cycles, there comes a time to die. There's a time to live, and there's a time to die. Most of our problem is we often don't know when it's a time for something to die. But it's a time for that to die. 
many of the issues that were related to that we have over the last two years been resolving and taking care of and finishing business so that graciously we can say we have done what we were asked to do with this thing called the rock and the rock of York but now it's time to move into our future so sometime in January we will become Q Church same great and greater service and there will be some change but don't be expecting that it will be so completely different that it will be unrecognizable because if you give a pub a makeover, it's still a pub, right? If you rebuild stands in a football stadium, it's still a football stadium, but you've made changes to it to make it work better and be better and do the job that it does. So we're not going to change radically because we have been changing radically, but we're going to change to accommodate and move forward what it is that we believe God is calling us to be. So, two interesting things. Number one, in a technological age where social media is critical to your communication, uh, it, it, it's good to Google things if you want to know where you stand. Because if we couldn't get any domain names that related to Q Church, or they were all weird, you know, that you had to have Q147 brown trousers you know, dot .com, uh, you could see it would be a non-runner. But, but guess what? Not another Q church anywhere in the world can you find online on any of the search engines. Now you can find things like Q ideas related to some churches. You can find things that have accommodated the, the letter Q in some things, but not another Q church that we are aware of or that we can find in the world. So we own all the domain names. Which, for those of you who are over 50, doesn't mean much. For those of you under 50, you realize how important that is. We've got the domain names. So we're up and ready to go. Now, you could also say, why didn't we wait and do a big splash launch, you know, because we haven't even got our font decided yet. We haven't got everything up and running. The reason we can do that, and we might do that, but I wanted to bring you along on the journey so that together we're moving towards that that rather than it being just some publicity stunt that's trying to be hip, we're actually saying, no, we're serious about this because this is not just a rebranding to make us hip. This is actually an embracing of a new name that celebrates who we are and who we are becoming. So we'll do the other bits as we go along now. So what does Q stand for? Um, my immediate thought when I saw the Q was question because... What we have sought to do is to create a culture of questions. Um, because in my view, the one thing that is lacking, or one of the things that is lacking, there are many things lacking, but one of the things lacking in the Christian community is the, is the openness to question, to be questioned, to ask questions about anything and everything. Very much it is a closed shop, all collated around dogmas that have been predecided. And the question is whether you accept it, not whether you debate it, not whether you have any, it's whether you accept it. And uh, we have not built that culture, we're not building that culture, and will not build that culture. So I know we've been building a culture of questions, where questions are not ridiculed, not resisted, not rejected, they're accepted. And that has come from the integrity of Chris and I going a journey where we have asked a thousand questions or more, about our faith, about God, about eternity, about all the constituent parts that we believe make up Christianity to say, have we got this somewhere near where it should be? And we wouldn't be arrogant to say that we've got it right, but what we're doing is asking the questions and making opportunity for our hearts to be changed, for our lives to be molded into something that is not, is not, is not dictated by religious model. Uh, that is not driven by, by common narrative, but has room to allow this wonderful God that we love and serve to reveal himself as he needs to to our generation. So I thought question at the beginning and questions, but in talking to Chris and, and, and some of the guys here, the leaders, uh, we, it really became clear that the Q actually stands for quest. So the Q in our Q church stands for quest. When you put I-O-N on the end of a word, it's a suffix, a word that you add on. And when you put I-O-N onto something, because question is quest with an I-O-N on the end, 
When you put the A-O-N on, you've tagged that onto the word, which is always words of Latin origin. You tag it onto that word, denoting the action that accompanies the word. So you can't be on a quest without questions. If you've got no questions, you are not on a quest. You're not on a quest for anything because the action of quest is question. So that incorporates who we are becoming and what has become the culture of the house into the reality of our direction, which is that we are on a quest. A faith quest, a spiritual quest, a human quest. A quest to find truth, a quest to know God better, a quest to reach our generation with the, with the more beautiful gospel than the one we were raised with. So, so the one thing we do know is that we'll be called Q Church and that our strapline will be join the quest. I think that's great, don't you? Q Church. Join, thanks, Dave. Thank you, sir. Q Church, join the quest will be our strap. Now, we've got a lot to put around that. Um, it gives you the name. That Q Church, join the quest, gives you the name and the, ex and, and, and the call to action all in one. What's also interesting is this is adaptable in many forms, and we have secured those websites. We even have Q York. Can you believe it? So we certainly will not have any problem finding the anthem to go along with the launch of Q Church, will we? When we've got Q York. We also have Q Network. We have all of those going along. And the, the interesting thing is the number of people that I have been connecting with for some years who have been going a journey with us who on hearing that this is the action we want to take are more than interested in becoming part of what they see as the Q Church Network. And uh, not a denomination, but just a joining of hearts and spirits and direction. So we're also looking forward to that because um, our calling is bigger than this, okay? Um, I'm not, I'm first of all too old to think about trying to build some mega church. It would drive me nuts. And, uh, you know, it would be comfortable, but it would drive me nuts. I'm interested in all the things that we reach because of who we are, okay? And uh, there are other things that go along with that that, that support that, which I won't, again, talk about in depth tonight, but you can check out if you go to Wednesday's message called uh, What's in a Name. So let me do uh, one last little segment on this. Um, on the 29th of September this year, which is not long ago, um, I was in Salt Lake City, and I was having to make some major decisions and uh, there's a whole story goes with that. Again, that's, that's on the message online. You can catch up with it if you're interested, but not tonight. Uh, on that day when I was struggling with these questions, Kev Craven suddenly uh, WhatsApped a message, and, and it simply said this, okay? I think we need to talk Baobab again. Do you remember? Now, just bear in mind, he's sending that to a man, yeah, but this was coming to me on my phone. I'm a man, okay? This, this was longer than a month ago. Do you remember was not a valid question. It was like... Because this one here, she like remembered way back to when Kev had first done that and could associate everything with it. Now, there's a whole backstory goes with that. What was fascinating is many of you will have... In fact, most of you have never heard of the, the baobab. The baobab is a tree that is in several continents, but predominantly in Africa. And it is the strangest tree you could ever imagine. We had had some experience of it, believe it or not, just three weeks before Kev sent his text, which is fascinating. Um, and suddenly, there's all this attention being drawn to this baobab tree. Now, I think Kev's uh, sending that text about the baobab tree was just as accurate as my seeing the dark-haired guy with the paralyzed face or seeing this altar to an unknown god or any of the other myriad of, in, in, uh, of, of, of incidents that I've experienced. The timing of it and the content of it was brilliant. Now you say, well, there's not much there. There's actually more than you think, okay? But I'm not going to go into it all. All I want to say is that the facts of the baobab, and this is the point, are a perfect description of what I feel has happened to me and to us over the past 10 years. So if you take the time to research it, you'll understand why. Let me just give you the very briefest thing. The, the, have you got that picture of the baobab? You see the baobab? It's a weird-looking thing, a bit like us 
to most people think we're rather strange and don't look like a conventional church or normal Christians, just like the baobab has been looked at, it's not a normal tree, it's not a conventional tree, but I'll tell you what, it's a brilliant tree that has longevity and life, and you just go read up about it, you'll find it interesting. But this is the most fascinating thing. Um, it, it really looks like the legend says. This is the legend about the baobab. It was pulled up by God and thrust back into the ground upside down. So its roots, its roots are what are on show to the world. The irregular but highly successful nature of this tree are all absolutely worth a Google. Here's how I have felt for the last 10 years. And, and Kev's little text just brought all that to a head. And the call to change the name has clarified the whole thing. I feel that I got ripped out of the ground and stuck in upside down. But the importance of that is, is that symbolically what is being revealed is the roots. Your life is exposed. Your journey is exposed. How it, life comes to the tree is what is on show to people. There's a vulnerability. There is an honesty. There is an acceptance of the journey. A clear acceptance about the reality of the roots that are often hidden, but on the baobab tree, it looks as though they're the thing that everybody gets to see. And that's where the baobab grows its fruit. It grows its fruit from what look like its roots. And uh, it is one of the most nutritious superfoods. It's incredible, and uh, I think it's a great word about who we are. So enough said about that, because I said I wasn't going to give you the whole thing. Um, as far as the spirit of Q Church goes, I think this statement sums it up. I'd rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. That sums up the culture, the heart, the spirit of who we have become and who we are becoming. I'd rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned because that's what religion does. Okay, so finally, and then I'll come back later to say another few words, let me show you an ancient African proverb that describes the baobab. Remember last week what I felt chose me and I had to talk to you about it was wisdom. And then all of a sudden this week, middle of this week, uh, we've got this coming up, all connected. But I love this. Wisdom is like a baobab tree. But this is why like no one individual can embrace it. The reason being this tree grows wide which means it can't be a one-person thing. You can't put it all on. You can't reach around the tree. No one person can embrace it. We embrace it together. And my desire for you, my cry to you, my call for you, is that if we are a baobab tree in our call to be Q Church, can we embrace it together? Yeah. Right. There you go. Done. <laughs> well, I wanted the guys to sing that song, 526. As 525,600 minutes. Because it's such an important number. Um, every one of those 525,600 minutes is a minute of a year in your life. <clears throat> and uh, there are some people in here who've, who are older than me, but I, I think they would echo what I say, that as you get older, you begin to realize that time, time is not a never-ending commodity like you thought it was. <clears throat> when you were running around as a kid. And uh, I, th I was thinking, you know, 26 years ago, I took the senior pastorate of this house. Um, will I still be here in 26 years? I'm hoping to be still here in 26 years to see the next phase of the legacy that's handed on. I'm hoping I'm not senior anything in, in 26 years other than a senior. Because um, uh, I shouldn't be. We'll have missed the boat if we do that. But... But you begin to wonder, and of course, uh, time is not a never-ending commodity, how we all spend it. And the point is, we think, we think only those thoughts are necessary when you get older. But actually, the problem is, who we are when we get older, we're formed by what we did with those moments when we were younger, when we were 16, 17, 18, 20, 21, 25. And uh, so in line with, with, with what I've said about the the change of name in the church, I want to just challenge us as people to be in that same spirit. Moments matter. Moments matter. And if we make our moments matter, the truth is, 
we make what matter what truly matters rather than most of the stuff that we're into that doesn't actually matter at all. Um, the ones of us who've got a little more years on us <coughs> look back and, and will agree with this. I'm absolutely convinced of that. But those of you who've not yet lived most of your life would do well to take note, okay? This is important for you. Because there are moments of good decisions and there are moments of bad ones. There are moments that affect moments. But there are also moments that affect millennia. There are some things that, that we do in a moment that the effects of it last for all of our life. And uh, there are just some moments in each of our lives that the impact and repercussions of which will affect the entire course of our life. Now, from a positive angle, you might say, wow, that's amazing. Because you think of the, the power of a moment. And that's why, that's why I believe it's important to understand in the realm of spirit and in a realm of the God who is kind and who is good, that to, to find a place where you can hear what he is saying and do what he is saying, those things affect you for a lifetime and often for generations. Um, but there's a negative angle to that as well, which is, okay, so if, if moments impact our lives to the effect where there are repercussions for the entire course of our life, is that reversible or not? It's a good question. I would say it depends what it is. The mind can often be changed, but the circumstances very often can't. Uh, but you always have the option of refusing to take the stance in that the circum is demanding. I've talked about this for a few weeks on the trot. Circumstance made up of two words. Circum meaning circle and stance meaning stand. A circumstance is a circle in which you stand, so don't stand in the circle. Sounds awfully simplistic, but actually moments are about that. Moments can mean that you make a decision that you are just not going to, you're just not going to stand in the circum. That you are going to make choices and decisions that by the grace of God moves you out of the circum. And let me say, no circum is inescapable. Every circumstance can be changed because you have the power to step outside of the circum and change the place that you stand. But these are all parts of taking hold of the moments that matter and making some decisions. So, another question, where do God and spirituality figure in all of this? Because if we're not careful, we actually live our life or can live our life devoid of an aspect of our life which is the one aspect that can give us the real insight and revelation that we need for that life. And uh, I'm not here to argue today, I believe that's the Abba of Jesus, the God of Jesus. Um, I think a lot of people in the world have been bright enough to realize that there has to be a spirit connection somehow with something somewhere. Now, um, I... I cannot validate all religious conclusions, but uh, if you want to be fair on that, I can't validate all conclusions that Christians will tell you. So, But I do know that God is for real. I do know we have a spirit, and I do know that things like that dream and seeing that man don't come from any learned, educated uh, perspective. They come from a dimension that is not governed uh, by natural laws. It is not governed by natural reasoning. You can't obtain that by natural understanding when you don't know about it. That's because of this thing called spirit. Now, my, my heart belief is that the God of Jesus, if you connect with him in that spirit, is the one who will lead your life and guide your life and give you insight and understanding because he can see more than you can see and he knows more than you know and he's desperate to share that with you so that your life lives under the light of heaven's revelation. The reason God in creation put stars in the sky was for navigation. Until we had Satan navigation, which was abbreviated to Satnav, which I don't trust because it will lead you astray. How did men navigate? 
We navigate it by the stars. We look to the heavens. We realize that if you want to know the direction to move on the earth, you have to look to the heavens. You can't guide yourself by just looking at what is around you in the earth. You have to look to the heavens. You have to look to the stars. It's still the same. But because we have technology and stuff, and humanism and hedonism, we don't think we need to look to the heavens to get our direction in life, I propose to you that just as from the beginning, if you want to go in the right direction, you have got to look to the heavens. And I believe that's the whole message of Jesus. It's the truth of the beautiful gospel that God is not hiding anything, but he wants you to see the path or the course that you should go. Now, do I believe there's one course you should go and if you get it wrong, then you're damned? Absolutely not. But I think there's a direction you should go. So, does a sensitive ear ear and a willing obedience matter? I think it does. I think it does more than we give credence to. A sensitive ear and a willing obedience. That means coming to a place where actually you're prepared to receive guidance that is not just coming from your own very limited knowledge and understanding. You know, Google doesn't compare with the revelation from God. Google can only tell you stuff that's known. But God can tell you stuff that's not known. And when you begin to live in that, it's not spooky, it's not weird, it's not strange. Because if I was speaking to a French person now, hopefully I would try to communicate with them in French. Um, for those like, um, those, those, um, those who speak foreign languages, like this person here who I've known all these years and I can't remember you. Ruth. Sorry, Ruth. <laughs> Listen, I mean, it's you and doings and Chuck. Is, that's how my life is now. That doings. Hey, you. That doings. Hey, Chuck, come here. Um, Ruth. Ruth is fluent Spanish. Spanish teacher. If, if she wanted to communicate with a Spanish Spaniard, she would communicate in Spanish. If she wanted to... Sp- communicate with the Catalans. She can even communicate in Catalan. That's how amazing she is. The reason I say that is that when God speaks to an anth, he speaks to an anth in language that an anth understand. When God speaks to a Beth, he speaks to a language that a Beth can understand. So her communication will probably be about dogs. <laughs> Howard. Thus saith the Howard. But sincerely, you, if you are being spoken to in a language you understand, it's not strange because you actually hear it in a way that you readily take on board and you don't feel out of the conversation. Listen, God wants to speak to you and he will speak to you in a language that you understand, whether it's pictures or words or conversations or, or weird things going on. There will be stuff that he will get through to you because I think that we need a sensitive ear and a willing obedience and they really, really matter. And And then the third question on that, does faith still have a place in our modern world? You bet you it does. And I don't mean the Muslim faith or the Christian faith or the Baha'i faith. That's a misuse of the word faith. It's a misuse of the word faith. I mean faith where you place your belief and trust in the goodness and faithfulness of God Faith in who he says that you are and who he says that he is so that as those things blend together, you have a power in the world. I I believe that faith is still has a massive place in our world. Now, let me say another couple of things before I just bring this to a close. Um, Let's talk about regret for a moment. Regret is a very powerful human emotion. And uh, it's one that often comes more into focus in later life or when we encounter loss. Uh, And some people never recover from it. Uh, It's something that we can all become affected by. Regret. But regret is the consequence of not appreciating that moments matter. And so when we don't engage the moments that matter, we often find ourselves in regret because we look back and see the things that we could have done to make those moments better better parents your kids will be all grown up and doing their thing before you can blink an eye make sure they know they're loved 
valued, appreciated, that they're worthy, that they don't have to do anything to gain that worth. Make your friendships built on something other than what that friendship can give to you. Don't live with regrets. People you need to tell that you love them, tell them you love them now. Don't wait and say, I wish I had only said to you how much you affected my life how much I was blessed, how much you helped me. Don't come to a place where you live with regret. Moments matter. Do it, speak it, be it, live it now. Live the moment because what that will do is it will set the course of your life. And what I wanted to say on that, because I think this is very important, direction is more important than destination. See, in some ways, if you need to get to a destination, it doesn't matter which direction you go, you can still get to the destination. It might take you longer, but you'll still get there. So if I want to get to Acom, but I set off in the wrong direction, I could circumnavigate the earth, and if I keep going in that straight line, I will arrive at Acom. Now, it might be in, in several weeks' time, but I will get there. But actually, I could get there in 10 minutes. Because direction is important. Direction is the most important thing in your life. Which direction are you living in? Don't be obsessed with destinations. Be obsessed with direction. Can I set my course going in the right direction. Now, I believe all those elements that we've talked about of, 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 of faith and, and, and having an ear on obedience and, and all those things, recognizing moments, they play a part in setting the direction of our life. Because you see, the problem is, much of the church has become destination obsessed. So it's all about, if you do wrong, you'll go to hell, destination. If you do right, you'll go to heaven, destination. When actually, Jesus' message was never about a destination. It was about a direction. If you follow me, that's the direction. If you follow me, I will make you. Follow me, okay? So, so I, I want to encourage you tonight that, that bearing in mind these things of the importance that moments matter... And issues of faith, if you will set a direction that incorporates those things, you are going to find that it's not that critical that you determine the destination because you're going to get to a good place. And I think the Bible supports that. It's not a book about destination. It's a book about direction. So, let me, let me finish. Just three things. Learn to recognize a God moment. Now, you do have to learn that. In the same way that a child learns to recognize its mother's voice, you know, we all think, well, you know, God speaks, and, and of course, too many people think God speaks in a very deep voice, and some people still think God speaks in King James English, in these and thous, and it must be God, because he said, art thou listening? And we've kind of been subconsciously, religiously raised that if it's in Old English, it must be powerful. When that's silly, that was just, it wasn't Old English when it was written. It was like we talk today, it was how they talked then. But the issue is, in, in learning to recognize a, a, a God moment, you know, it was fascinating when you're a parent. And uh, I think even more acutely when you're a grandparent. You in a crowded room can hear your child or your grandchild. You hear their voice and it's like, it's like they were the only person in the room. You pick it out. And if there was any danger, any issue, and they ever cried out for help, I would have no problem recognizing Joel Connie or Riley's voice or Chris's voice. It would immediately come. But that's something you learn to recognize that by relationship. You learn to recognize the voice of God. You learn to recognize a God moment by, by opening your heart up and being ready to see how God is actually already showing you things and speaking to you and helping you and guiding you. And the more you're willing to embrace that as a reality, the more you recognize these moments, which are God moments. And I could tell you of some that have been happening to us over the last three weeks that are just, you know, it just, again, it, it humbles me and staggers me that God would, would be so clear in what he wants to say using means that in my language I understand. And that's, that's a story for another day. Learn to recognize a God moment. Don't look at everything through its immediate impact is another lesson. 
We're always looking at things of, if it doesn't have an impact like now, like this second, this minute, uh, then I'm done with it. Stop looking in the short term for immediate impact. Look at things through a longer term. Look at things through a greater lens. Realize that these moments are shaping something that go beyond the moment. It's not just about what happens now. It's about what these are creating that you will walk into. And here's my third one. Have faith in the goodness and faithfulness of God. That's where I am. Have faith in the goodness and faithfulness of God. Cassil with you. Okay, so let me, a few statements just to finish. Remember also that God, that the God I believe and believe in is the God of hope, is the God of the second, third, and fourth chance. So in case any of you should have thought, well, you know, this is scary. It's not scary at all. Because this God is the God of hope, is the God of the second, third, and fourth chance. In fact, the 70 times seventh chance. He's the great adjuster, and thank God for that. He's made many adjustments as I've, I've responded. He's the great redeemer. He'll buy stuff back. He's the great restorer. He'll put things back to where they should be. And I love this one the best. He's the great friend. And you learn to let him transition from being, there's too much talk about him being a great God and not enough talk about him being a great friend. And the talk about being a great God actually comes from pagan religion and it comes from pseudo-Greek mythology that is all about, if my God's not greater than your God, my God's not really a good God, so my God has to be greater than your God. So the issue for us is not recognizing that God is great, that he's a great God, it's recognizing that he's a great friend. That's the message of Jesus, bringing him home. He is the great friend to all, what's that? It's the ungodlike God. So here's how we finish. I love this statement from dear old Brennan Manning, who I appreciate very much. You will not be measured by the good that you do, but by the grace you accept. Always understand that, because otherwise you'll start to think that it's by achievement. If I strive, if I do stuff, then this God person will somehow speak to me. That's not how it works. It, the more grace you accept on your life, the more you'll start to hear and see this stuff going on. Because it, it flows from the grace on your life. You will not be measured by the good that you do, but by the grace you accept. Now, I need to tell you something. When I read that today from some old notes, because I wanted to copy and paste it, I had made a spelling error, and so it read like this. You will not be measured by the good that you do, but by the grave you accept. But actually, I think that was a revelation. You will be measured by the grave you accept. There comes a point where you need to accept a grave into which all the stuff goes that messes with the importance of moments, that screws you up in your own head and convinces you of your own unworthiness, your own inability, and if God was going to speak, he wouldn't want to speak to me, and all that nonsense. You need to have a grave into which that goes, okay? So that you are not measured by the good you do, but by the grave you accept. I have accepted there is a grave into which lots of stuff in my life has to go, and then I'm going to fill it over, and I'm not going to mark it with anything. And some of you, if you would do the same, the grave that you accept, I need a grave in my life to put that stuff in, and this is not the one that resurrection comes from, it's the one where all that stuff is buried, so that the grace can begin to show through. So let me read you one scripture and then, and then you'll realize it was a proper preach because I read a scripture to you. Okay, um, Just for some of my critics online. Open up, okay, Romans 5, the message. One statement along with this and we're done. Romans 5 from the message. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, make us fit for him, we have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. This is what I like. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. Listen to this. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand 
out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory. That's where this direction will take you. That's where this understanding will take you in the moments that matter. Finding yourself standing where you always hoped you might stand in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory. Standing tall, shouting our praise and then just the first little bit of verse 3 and there's more to come. There's more to come. So let me read to you an amended quote from something that Bishop Tom Wright wrote. If we're only made for spirituality, we wallow in introspection. If we're only made for joy, we settle for pleasure. If we're only made for justice, we clamor for vengeance. If we're only made for relationship, we insist on our own way. If we're only made for beauty, we're satisfied with sentiment. But new creation has already begun. The sun has begun to rise. Christians are called to leave behind in the tomb of Jesus Christ all that belongs to the brokenness and incompleteness of the present world. That, quite simply, is what it means to be Christian. To follow Jesus Christ into the new world, God's new world, which he has thrown open before us. Join the quest. And so the song says, so start spreading the news. We're leaving today. I want to be part of it. Q York. Q York. Because if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. It's up to you. Q York. Q York. Father, help us to grasp and grab this. Help us to take hold of every moment and realize out of the owning of those moments flows a direction in our life that brings us into the wide open spaces of grace where your goodness and kindness invade every moment of our existence and bring us to the fullness that you always desired so that we can be a testimony to the world of the goodness of this God who has become our friend. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are, we're going to pay it forward. The buckets are coming round, and uh, we bless you. And don't forget the offering for going next week. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.